Welcome to Hope on Fire, relevant talk radio for young adults. Whether you're 25 or 45, there's bound to be a discussion that you care about. Our mission is to share practical ways to find God in your everyday life. And now let's join today's host, Rick Mann. Last week, some friends and I went to a Chinese restaurant. After we paid our bill, my friend Darren broke open his fortune cookie, and inside was this little gem of wisdom. Draw up a budget and figure out how to cut down on your debt. Well, that's great advice, but it's easier said than done. But if you're anything like me, it's advice that you wish that you had received a long time ago. If you're like a lot of 20 or 30-somethings, long-term planning with budgets and researching and savings and retirement plans or, or worrying about credit card interest rates, well, that takes a backseat to more immediate concerns like, well, what, what am I going to be doing Saturday night or figuring out which high-def TV you're going to buy? Unfortunately, many of us put off securing our financial future simply because we just don't know where to begin. Well, that's what we're going to fix today here on Hope on Fire. We're going to learn specifics on how to practically apply that fortune cookie wisdom. And joining us today to set us straight is Hope on Fire's contributing editor for Careers and Monday, Money, Randy McGreg. Randy, thanks for joining us. Thanks, Greg. Glad and to be si- here. And sitting next to Randy today is, oh, nobody else. So guess what, Randy? You get to do a lot of talking. It's just me. <laughs> it's just you. It's just me. So I get to ask a lot of questions, and you get to do a lot of answers. So Great. Looking forward to that. Um, hey, let's just start this off. Why is a show on finance fundamentals so important, especially from a Christian perspective? Uh, well, from from a Christian's perspective, I think there's a lot of times where, as Christians, it's not something that we talk about amongst ourselves necessarily, maybe yeah. close close friends, but as a general rule, we don't like to you know people to know how much we make. Maybe they can figure out how much we give, things of that nature. So <laughs> we just kind of like to ca- kind of tie those up and keep those separate. Or figure out how much we should be giving. <laughs> or how much we should be giving versus what we do, things right, of that right. nature. So I think it's it's a very personal issue to a lot of people. Well, I mean, it's not just personal, but from a spiritual standpoint, it's something that you know, it, it, it's a it's a large part of our life, right? Yeah, I mean, you, everything these days requires money. I mm-hmm. mean, you don't you know you own a house, you rent your car, your your groceries. I mean, most I don't know too many people that just have a garden that completely sustains them for the year with the root cellar that you're putting <laughs> things in to keep it through the winter right. or you know things like that. So, money is really what makes our lives go round. I right, mean, it's what gets us from A to B and allows us to you know sustain life. Right. Well. Let's let's just start off from the very beginning. You know, one of the things when we start talking about financial fundamentals, uh, where do we need to start? What's the what's the one of the first things that if, if we're trying to get our life in order and we really want, want to be serious about how we take our finances, not only now but you know, planning for the future, where do we need to start? Budget. Uh, budget. Budget oh. is not a dirty word. You it's sure? a good word. Yeah, it is, it's yeah. a B word, right? Yeah, it's not as fun as vacation <laughs> or windfall or you know lottery winner. Right. But, uh, it Fast is Fast car. Yeah, no, it is the uh, it is though uh, the basis of what we need to do to determine where we are financially. Okay. And the budget is also. I mean, it's, think of it as a good word because if you have a budget, and then you really know where you're at, and and budget can be a good thing because once you've got yourself set in your budget, you know what you have to spend. Right. Now, I think one of the problems that a lot of young people have, and I had this problem specifically, and in some ways I guess I still do, is that I didn't have really good parents. That Well, I did have Ouch. a very good parent. I should take that back. I, it's not the way it sounded. I, I, had, I had a great mom, but one of the things that she didn't impart to me, partially because she didn't know any better, was good financial wisdom or how to do things. So I think a lot of us in the audience probably know what a budget is, but can you explain, maybe give us some more detail and, and give us some things that we sh- really should be tracking on a budget and how we get that set up? Great. Um, basically, you're trying to determine um, uh, it's a schedule of your income and expenses. So okay. it's not just expenses. You need to know how much money you're bringing in versus how much you're taking out. Right. So, well, the, the coming in is the easy part, I think. I mean, I get a paycheck every two weeks. I can look at the pay stub. I see that. It's the expenses that are going out that is the hard thing. Sometimes. Right, and there's all kinds of expenses. You have routine expenses. These are things you can count on every month. These are your mortgage, insurance, taxes, groceries, things of that nature. Things that pop up. My car, you know, died this week, and it's at the shop. It's going to cost me five hundred dollars to get out. Fixed expenses again. The mortgage, things like that. You can count on it being the same every month. The things that are variable. The car, the breaking down. Right. Things that you need to have set aside to take care of those. Um, and just expenses in your discretionary funds, money that after everything is paid, what's left over for right. my going to see a movie or going to, you know, any other thing that the fun things that you want to do. Gotcha. And I, I think the, like I said, the easy part is knowing where the money 
is coming in from. We know that. That's right. that's fixed every month. And I have large fixed financial expenses every month. Like right. you said, I've got my house. I've got the car. I've got my electric bill, the water bill, my phone. Um, but you said a word in there that, you know, is kind of the, the mysterious gray area where the rest of my money goes is discretionary income. Right. I know I need to pay the, you know, pay the phone or it's going to get cut off, but it's the rest of the money that I have a problem with because it's like, I don't know where that goes. Well, the discretionary is the fun money. And unfortunately that's typically where, uh, that's where the first cuts usually come. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, when you sit down and, and you have a budget, you can say, wow, I, I went out every morning this week for breakfast right. and last week and the week before, and I spent $200 last month going out for breakfast when I could have a bowl of Wheaties at home home and probably right. save myself, you know, $200. Right. And so, you know, that's where the budget helps you identify areas where you may be spending more than you think you're spending. Right. Um, and areas where maybe you can cut back that you don't even really care about. Well, that's not, you know, whenever I've heard about budget and, you know, planning for this, I, that's the thing I dread. I'm like, <laughs> you know, do I really have to stick every single receipt in my pocket? And then at the end of the week, now I've got 15, 20, 30, 50 receipts and I got to total those up, and I do that maybe one or two weeks, and then I, I you know, I don't do it. Um, I know one of the things that I've been trying to do is use everything on my debit card because now I can go online to my online bank account, and I can actually see where everything's going and get it down, you know, download, put it on my spreadsheet, and categorize. So that that helps a little bit. But you said another bad word in there too. You said cuts, right? Ooh, cuts. Yeah, <laughs> and no one wants. You know, we don't want to hear about cuts because right. cuts aren't fun. Right. But the budget will help you see the gray area where that discretionary income is going and maybe better, you know, maybe put some lights on, you know, to see where, where it's going and where you can start, you know, being a little bit more smart with your money? Well, the cuts can even be not necessarily, they don't always have to be bad. I mean, it could be to, um, if you looked and saw, well, wow, I'm really spending a lot of money in gas, but, you know, my friend works at the same place I do or within the same area. Maybe we could work out a carpool. I could cut my gas bill by half if I drove half the time, they drove half the time. Right. Um, you know, maybe I could, you know, set my temperature up in my house two more, three more degrees if I could stand it and lower that bill. So there's ways around it. I mean, if you need to cut something that might just be more of a comfort issue and so I can have fun. I mean, there's ways to work around that. You right. just need to know what you're spending and where you can make those. Right. Because I think it, it, you would surprise yourself yeah. where the money yeah. goes. Now, the other thing, too, and let's touch on this for a second, you know, there, there are those things where you can't budget for. Yeah. Well, at least you don't think that you can. Those are like the car breaking down. I right. mean, it's not like my car's going to break down every month, so I'm going to put in, you know, $100 into my car breakdown fund. Well, unless I have a, a really crummy car, I guess. <laughs> but, you know, how, how do you budget for that? Is that something you just put a little bit in each month for when it does happen or, or what? Well, once you have your budget established, you can see where, you know, you get a better picture. You can see where do I have extra that I could take? Where do I have? Or, and maybe you end up with more discretionary funds than you really realize. But, right. it, you know, if breakfast every morning for a month is taking really all those out and we're finding ourselves with a car, like you said, that is just nickel and diming us to death, we may need to have Evaluate, you know, do we have to keep taking the bus, or are we going to take less time, less trips to Burger King for breakfast? Right, right. So whichever way that needs to work out, but you can definitely find extra money, and you really need to have that working towards a savings where they're out of that discretionary pie. There's got to be some money that goes to, yeah, 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 yeah. the emergency the fund. Part, right. We don't like to talk about that. Well, either. okay. Well, let's move on to that that other aspect of financial uh, fundamental fundamentals, I should say, is savings. Now, that's, that, that is kind of a uh, dirty S word for some people. <laughs> it can be, but here's the good part. The, you know, we're talking about the discretionary, the fun money right. that sometimes has to take a hit. Right. Well, in the savings, that's where you build it back. You got to have – the savings really can be broken down, I think, as far as we're talking in budgets in three different areas. Mm -hmm. We need to have an emergency fund. Okay. Typically, if you can have three months, six months, if the, uh, the more the better. That's um, the rainy day fund. Is that what you would – another way fund. to call it? Okay. Yep. A rainy day fund, and this way you can have you have money that you have access to. So when you have the car breakdown or the refrigerator quits, or for whatever reason, or you're just behind, you know, you get behind on your bills, you miss some work, you've mm -hmm. got money to rely on to you know to hold you through those times. Right. Um, you also have, uh, for a lot of us that may be, you know, checking account at the end of the month is usually down about two, three dollars. Want to make sure that we don't overdraft. You can have an overdraft uh, typically at your bank. Mm -hmm. Doesn't earn a lot of interest, but if you keep, you know, two, three, four hundred dollars, whatever it is that right. you may typically go over by. Um, not and so I do that. I actually, yeah. with my bank, it's I have an auto draft for like twenty bucks a month goes into that. 
Yeah. And you'd be surprised, you know, in, you know, in a year you've got a couple hundred bucks in there and it's there just in case you, in case. you know, swipe that debit card and, you know, <laughs> you were, you didn't, uh, you you're were... out on the date and the girl's like, uh, your car got rejected. <laughs> <laughs> you have no money in your checking account. You left. weren't counting receipts that week and you didn't really realize where you're at. I get it. Right, right. Yeah. Uh, yeah, and that too. Once you get to the, your threshold, there, I would continue to keep that monthly going, right. and then you can always take the excess and put it over into the fun account. I mean, it right. isn't like that, you know, that it's stuck there for some right. reason. Right. Um, and then also, you want to, you know, there's another fund. We're the fun fund. You okay. know, let's have let's have some fun. I mean, so much money every month goes into that fund. I mean, right. when you want your new flat panel, you don't have to, you know, go in credit card debt. You can pay it for cash, mm -hmm. your vacations. Um, the new touchscreen iPod, whatever you're looking for, right. that's where this, that's where you can get those items by uh, working on one of those. And I think that's probably you're hitting on a topic indirectly that a lot of young people have. And I, I'm 36 now, and I kind of still have this problem: is you really have to look at the future because yeah. it, you cannot be short-sighted on this. Just, I mean, even if you're short-sighted a month or two. When you're saying you're, we're saving money for those rainy day things or we're saving up for that vacation, we have to be thinking about that vacation 12 months ahead of time to say, okay, where do I want to go and how much am I going to need to spend? And now I have to say, okay, well, how much do I have to save now? And that's not easy for some people. Some people, they, they just look at the yeah. short term, right? Yeah, it's all about, I mean, it's all about planning your future because everything that we're talking about today requires a, you know, you looking into the future and saying, what is it that's important to me? What is it that I'm trying to accomplish? Right. And if that's taking a vacation or buying a new TV or uh, any of those things, buying a new car, I'm right. at least gonna, I, I want to be able to save a down payment so I don't have to finance the whole works. I mean, there's all those different things you have to be looking out for. And, you know, even, you know, the emergency fund, too. Once your emergency fund gets up, those, again, are funds you can divert to the other so that th we don't want to make it all about we have to save every last penny because then what fun is it? I mean, right. you got to have some fun once in a while. But if you do it in a systematic way where you've got thresholds set and you know where your money's going, and that you can put them into the different areas as needed to make sure that you're protected. Right. It also gives you a peace of mind because you're not worried about, you know, something happened this month, my car broke down, where am I going to come up with the money? It's not mm -hmm. a big deal. You just, you know, send it in, get it fixed. You know you've got the money and you move right. on. Yeah, I know with the rainy day fund, for me in particular, I really didn't start worrying about my job, for instance, and getting laid off until I actually got laid <laughs> off. I'm like, uh, now what do I do? The great motivator. Yeah, right, exactly. And, uh, you know, one of the things that I was able to have, I didn't have much of a, th well, my rainy day fund was my mom that lived, you know, a couple <laughs> blocks away. And I was like, oh, I'm going to have to move out of my apartment and go back to live with mom. <laughs> so at least I had that there. But since then, you know, after you've gone through that once or twice, once you've hit been hit with well, my transmission just went out of my car. Now I got to spend fifteen hundred dollars. Right. Well, that'd be a really expensive transmission on a really expensive car. But you know, you know what I mean. I right. mean, once that hits once or twice, that kind of brings a reality check in. I think for a lot of young people. Well, and it's also it's avoiding some of those situations. Mm -hmm. I mean, when, like you said, once it happens, that's a motivator. Like I don't want that to happen right. again. But then there has to be something in place so that it doesn't happen again, and that's only by planning. Gotcha. Well, uh, we are talking about financial fundamentals, and we're going to be returning here on Hope on Fire. We're going to talk a little bit more about savings and get into the R word, retirement, right after this. We'll be right back. Welcome back to Hope on Fire. This week we are talking about financial fundamentals with our contributing editor, Randy McGray. Randy, thanks Good for joining here, us. Good to be Rick. You know, it's kind of funny. Uh, when I was typing this outline up this week, I accidentally typed in fundamentalism. And I got this idea that this guy was going to come running in and said, if you don't, you know, fix your budget, you know, he was going to call us infidels or something. So <laughs> I, thought that was kind of, I thought that was kind of funny. You know, right before the break, we were talking about savings. Now, again, one of those things, it's you save for the future. You have to have a long-term outlook. What do you talk to, what, how do you tell the person who says, I just don't have any money to save? I, I've looked at everything. I just don't have any money to save. It's something that I can't do. What do you, what do you say to that person? Well, I think more than likely, um, they probably don't have a budget. If they had <laughs> a budget, one, right. yeah. If they had a budget, they'd know that there is something there. I mean, there's. I mean, there, there really isn't anyone that can't say, um, even even if it's five dollars a, a month. Right. I mean, something. You have to start the seed. You have to put the budget in plan. In the budget isn't some complicated 
uh, equation that you know you have to go to college to figure out and, and be a you know math professor. It's, it's not just, rocket science. No, it's just it's just basically itemizing everything so that you know what you have. Right. And if you start everything we talked about, if you start your basic overdraft account, you start your rainy day fund. You know, you you take care of the fun, the fun fund, right. and you know you take care of those things. And even if it's just minuscule, every year. You know, if you can add a little bit to those per month, like you said, you had the years going in like twenty dollars a month. Mm-hmm. Next year, make it twenty five. I mean, whatever it is. So even if it's not a lot over time, it's going to work for you. Right. It's going to get there. Well, you know, uh, I was reading an interesting book that a friend of mine recommended when I told him we were going to be doing the show by David Bach called The Automatic Millionaire, and he, he in there he refers to the latte factor, or you could call it the smoothie factor, where it's like you know if you really knew where you were spending your money, you would be surprised. And for the person who says, you know what, I I don't have it. Like, well, if you really look at it, you know, that muffin in the morning that costs you a buck fifty or three bucks over time, you know, for the whole month is costing you what, 10, you know, 30, 60 bucks. There's sixty dollars right there I'm spending in muffins that maybe I didn't know about. Right. And it was just it was really interesting. The other thing that you said is even if it's just a little bit, that really does add up over time. It's, it's, it's really interesting. There's a there's a thing in here that just really just blew my mind that said, you know, if you can put away, say, a hundred dollars a month. Even at a modest 5%, modest modest 5%, even $100 a month, over 35 years, you're going to have well over $100,000. Now, it doesn't right. sound a lot, but if you can save even more than that, this is the other uh, interesting fact that I just thought it was unbelievable. If you put away $250 a month into a savings account or a retirement, which we'll talk about in a minute, and get closer to 10%, which is a little bit more realistic, over uh, starting at 25, if right. you put 250 in, by the time you're 65, you'll have $1.6 million. Right. $1.6 million. And you're like, oh, well, that's a little bit, that's you know. That's different. Yeah, that puts things into perspective. It's but like it's it, not different than what you talked about, though. The 100000 is a lot of money. Uh-huh. Even for, you know, you tell, tell someone that doesn't have anything that 100000 <laughs> isn't a lot of money. Right. So it's all perspective as to the amount. Of, I mean, for someone that's maybe making one hundred and fifty, two hundred thousand dollars $200,000 a year in salary, right. 100000 well, okay, that's pocket change maybe for what a savings account should be. Right. But even still, if for someone that doesn't have anything and you could still, like you said, there's a lot of ways you can come up with $100 a month to mm-hmm. put into savings. Right. Um, and if, if that means it's, you know, one less night out or two less nights out a month, that's only one every two weeks. You know, I mean, there's ways my, to My coworker, ways to find though, it. I was like, we were driving to lunch. <laughs> And I'm like, I'm tell- I was telling him this. He was like, yeah, but $1.6 million isn't a lot, a lot of money. I'm like, well, if I had $1.6 million in the bank right now, I think I'd be pretty rich. How good would that make you feel? How confident oh, yeah, if, would that make right. you feel, too? It would, it would be unbelievable. Right. Or he says, well, you know, in 30 years or 40 years when I retire, $1.6 million isn't going to be a lot. Well, it's like, number one, how do you know that? My $20,000 Accord that I bought 15 years ago is still $20,000 now to buy a new one. It's not exactly. like it's that much difference. No. And... Um, what the other thing was was that he was saying was was that you know I rather in just spend the money now, but you really have to think you know really think yeah, think but ahead. That's a classic excuse though, is to say, well, one point six million dollars in thirty to forty years when I retire, well, that won't be any that. That's but it's better be, than having nothing. That's going to be chump change. Well, the alternative to spending it all now is you'll have absolutely nothing, right. and so you'll It'd just be destitute. That's it. So, <laughs> you, you know, the, but I hear I've heard that excuse a lot uh, when it comes to that kind of thing. Is like, well, it's not that much. It's only five dollars. It's only ten dollars. What can I do with that? Right. When you start to do that, that gets a little infectious as well. As every month, when you get those statements, and you know you're looking at even five percent, which you can find in a in a, a savings account, in a savings now. account these yeah. days with with few restrictions, thirty mm-hmm. maybe a thirty day hold, sixty day hold, something like that. And even over time, when you see that start to build, it's like, well, wait a minute, where else could I find a little bit more to put in there? Because right. now I went online and I looked at my vacation that I want next year, and it's like, well, that's you know, it's twenty five hundred dollars. Maybe it's all inclusive. How am I going to get there between now and then? Right. Pretty soon you start finding other places. It's like, you know, I really don't need. I don't the, need that muffin in the morning. Don't need the muffin. I'd in the rather morning. go on the cruise. Yeah, I yeah. don't need the extra channels on the cable. I can mm-hmm. probably just go with the basic. I mean, there's ways that you can do that. So. A lot of times you hear those excuses, but it's because they've never committed to saying, at least giving it a try. Right. Say, let me do my budget. Let me right. give it even six months. And you might find that it gets to be more infectious than you think. Well, let me uh, just real quick, because we have a lot to talk about. And we're, we're halfway through the last half of the segment already. But where what are some of the better places to put the money for savings? Because a normal savings account that I'm going to get at my bank isn't going to pay me a lot, but there's some really interesting alternatives that you can get online, right? There are a lot. I mean, uh, just a few places I went and looked up, uh, ING Direct, um, HSBC Direct, lots of different banks. A lot of these um, mutual fund companies have now started opening up banks. Now, a direct bank is one that doesn't have a brick and mortar which you can walk into. Correct. It's actually all online, so they're actually able to give you more money on your interest because there's no overhead. They're sa- Right. They're saving you. They don't have the overhead, so they're giving 
giving you the better rate. Right. And a lot of these um, haven't been like a typical, uh, you know, even like a CD where you have things locked up for, you know, to get that kind of rate, maybe three years, five years. Right. And here, I mean, maybe 30 day hold on a lot of them. Some not even. So I could, I could put in $2,500 and in 30 days I could pull all, all of that of back, back out. out. And still have and still be getting a five percent or more. I've, uh, right. to some even closer to six. Right. So you know, there's a lot of different options where it's you don't have to feel like that's why you would do your overdraft account at your bank that doesn't really pay you anything, right. but they give it to you for free and such. But when you're looking to do these other accounts for your vacation right. funds and such, you may want to look outside to find a better rate. Gotcha. Well, let's move on to the R word retirement. And if Ooh. we have time, we might talk about some credit cards. But retirement, we talk. You know, when we talk about savings, we, we've talked about the rainy day fund. We've talked about the um, uh, overdraft protection. We've talked about the uh, fund money that we want for that vacation or the new TV. But the other aspect of savings is retirement. It is retirement. Correct. So, I mean, the thing is, is a lot of young people think, well, I'll be taken care of. You know what? The, the idea of a pension plan is that doesn't exist anymore, does it? N- not for No us. one's going to be taking, no one's watching out for me. My employer doesn't, you know, they might have matching funds, which we'll talk about, but th- it's not like there's this magical pot of money that I'm just going to magically get, you know, checks written to me every month, right? Oh, yeah, that's the truth. But the perception is Social Security. You know, oh, you right, know, there's, right. You know, I'll, hey, I'm getting, I'll be getting Social Security. And if they're getting, you know, if someone max these days, 1500 700 a month, man, I think what that's going to be 30 years down the road. <laughs> so instead of saying $1.6 million is not a lot of money because I don't earn any interest, right. well, Social Security really is not going to be a lot. Now, even cost of living right. increases that Social Security, you I mean, you maybe by the time we're 60 or 70, it might be $2,000, which isn't going to be any more than what it is today. So <laughs> right, right. they don't use the same logic for both. Gotcha. Well, what, what are some of the challenges that keep us from saving for retirement? Is there, are, are are they the same as we might have for savings, or it's exactly the same. We don't have enough, right? Um, you know, when I, by the time everything is done at the end of the month, I'm broke, right. which is true. I mm-hmm. mean, you know, you just maybe not knowing exactly where that money goes without the budget, and you know, the, you don't see the. It's we're so immediate reward driven, right? And there's no comfort in sending my money off to someplace I I don't even know who's there, <laughs> right. and they're going to take care of it for me till right. I need it when I retire. So there's, it's not a feel good thing. Now we're talking about 401ks here. I mean, that's what the vast majority of our audience probably would have from their employer or a version of that if they're self-employed, right? Right. Yes. If you have from your employer, you have 401k, 403b, uh, works the same and what, way. And what, what's basically doing, what's, what happens to our money when we write that, well, if it gets payroll deducted, I mean, what happens to that money? Where is it going? The money's going to, well, you select where the money's going. Okay. Hopefully you have someone to help you tell you where to put the money, right. whether that, you know, whether you're conservative, aggressive, it's basically going into mutual funds in okay. most portfolios, which are going into their purchasing stock uh, for you and in the anticipation that it's going to be worth more when you retire than it is when you put it in. Right. So, now, historically, Historically, yes. it always has been. Historically. The stock market's got the ups and downs, but when you're talking long term, you're talking, yes, the stock market is much better now than it was 10 years ago, 20 years ago, oh, 30 sure. years ago. Yeah. I mean, typically, it's I mean, between 8 and 12% is something that you could, uh, if you were in a you know media uh, a growth portfolio, that you could probably expect to have somewhere not in Not too range. conservative, not too aggressive, not but too, you're looking yeah. at 8 to 12 if you're somewhere, somewhere in, in the middle. Somewhere in there. That's a, that's, that's a pretty good return, right? It's a pretty good return, but it's hard to convince somebody that when the market's been down, you go back a couple of years, and when it was down for you know basically two, three years, I mean, right. there were little peaks and valleys, but for the overall, it was way down. And when you see your share value down at the dumps and you feel like you've lost all your money, it's hard to convince somebody that it's a good idea because they're not looking again long term. It's only short term right. what's in front of me. How much money should we be putting on our retirement? Well, at minimum, you need to be putting into your employer's plan at least what they'll match you. Okay, so, now if our employer has a matching fund, that's yeah. free money that we might be just completely giving up, right? Definitely free money because that's money they're giving you just for putting money in. So if you don't put it, you don't get it right. in most cases. I mean, obviously, that can be there can be variances, but definitely need to be taking advantage of the matching. Okay, yeah, because I think where I work, I get 4% matching. Right. They put a little bit in, which is piddly, but if you put in 4%, they'll give you 4%. So now, all of a sudden, now your 4% now becomes 8% of your your, you know, monthly take-home um, pay now in a retirement fund. Right. In that scenario. So 4% doesn't sound so much, but 8 that's actually a lot closer to 10 which is a lot of money. And that's a good target. If you're, t- if you're saving 10 or 15% in your retirement plan and you start early enough, like you talked about in the book, right. time is on your side. Compounding interest is what's going to get you to your goals, not by how much you can stuff away. Right. Obviously, that helps. The more you can, the more you'll have. But it's compound interest is your friend. Gotcha. Real quick, uh, I know this is on a lot of bo- a lot of people's minds. We've got less than a minute. Credit cards. 
Credit cards. Credit cards are evil. <laughs> Only keep the credit cards. You know, whittle down your cards to the ones that give you the best deal. Right. Play them off each other. Call them and say, I have three cards. Whoever gives me the best interest rate is the one I'm going to keep. Right. Only charge what you can pay off by the end of the month. And just make sure that you always know what you have. Check your account online on a frequent basis to know exactly so there's no surprises at the end of the month. I think that comes down to a real basic financial thing that, again, you know, if you had really good parents that were financially minded, probably would have told you is you don't buy anything on credit. It's like buying something that you don't have the money to pay off. Exactly. So, I mean, that, that that's that's a hard thing for a lot of people, though. I mean, we're getting credit cards our freshman year in college. Yeah, with, you know, even if it's a $500 limit, that's a lot to pay off when you're not making much. Right, right. And and try to pay the balance off every month if you can. Exactly. Right. Always. That's, that's a really big, huge thing. Yep. Well, you know, Randy, we've covered a lot of information today, and I want to say thank you. We're going to have to uh, do this again. Good time. And, and get, yeah, because it's uh, a lot more that we can be learning. You know, as we've seen today, the details are easy. Getting started, well, that's the hard part. You know, we've covered a lot of material, but listen, it's not rocket science. First, put together a budget. You have to know where the money is and where it's going. Second, start saving now. As we've seen, if you put money away now, it compounds over time. And third, control your spending. It doesn't take much every month to return a huge payoff in the end. If you want more details on some of the resources that we mentioned today, such as online budgeting tools, books, and tips, visit us on the web at www.hopeonfire.org. Also, if you have some questions you would like Randy to answer in the future, let us know and drop us a line. From all of us here at Hope on Fire, thanks for joining us. We'll see you again next week. Hope on Fire is produced by Livestreams Media, a listener-supported ministry. To download a free copy of today's program or be a part of our social network, please visit our website at hopeonfire.org. You may also contact us by writing to Livestreams Media, P.O. Box 608-513, Orlando, Florida, 32860. Once again, that's Livestreams Media, P.O. Box 608-513, Orlando, Florida, 32860, or online at hopeonfire.org. Thank you so much for your letters and continued support. Until next time, may God set your hope on fire.